Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the new Mainstream Podcast, where we explore the impact of multicultural consumers on marketing and media. I'm your host, Mario Carrasco, and co-founder of Think Now. Welcome to the new Mainstream Podcast. Excited to introduce our guest today, Sylvia Lee Sam, founder and CEO of Slam Media Lab. Welcome, Sylvia. Thanks, Mario. I'm excited to be here. So uh, this might sound really dense of me, but I just got your Slam Media name. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. I just made the connection. I, yeah, no, for sure. I was playing... Um, <laughs> I was playing a game and someone was like, oh, okay, what's your, what, what do you want your nickname to be or your username? And then I was just thinking of something fun and I was like, oh, yeah. I'll be slam from now. <laughs> it's that, no, that's great. Cause I was thinking of like slam media. I'm like, oh, that's like just yeah. a really, that's just a great name, powerful. And yeah. then I was like, all right, it's your last, it's yeah, I get it. Um, yeah. Awesome. So um, listeners, so I, I actually got to know Sylvia, through a really great conference, um, LTX Connect. Although I I don't think it will have, maybe it will have launched by the time this airs, um, but I joined last year and this year it was an up- updated format. So we were part of a round table together and I got to know Sylvia's story, which was amazing. So I invited her on to share um, with you all. So before we dive in, like tell us about your, your journey, Sylvia. And you can go as far back or as recent as you want, but would love to, would to love to know more about your founder journey. Yeah, no, thanks for asking. Um, so it does backtrack to my parents, as you can imagine. Um, my yeah. parents are actually both from China. They're from Guangzhou, China, and they moved to Peru in the eighties, um, like around like 1984. And, <clears throat> and well, first of all, for folks who are listening, Peru actually has a pretty big Chinese population. Uh, the not to go into the details, but you know, a lot of folks initially immigrated as slaves, um, and eventually, uh, folks fr- both from Japan and China started going to Peru because they saw that there was just a lot of opportunities. Uh, my parents specifically had um, a contact in Peru who were like, you know, hey, like it's not like wow, like amazing, especially in the eighties. But there, there are a lot more opportunities than in China in the 80s. Of course, things have changed, but at least back then, uh, my parents were uh, farmers. Uh, they were pretty poor, so they saved all their money and just decided to fly across the country, which is pretty insane. You know, you yeah. imagine being 20, flying a plane in the 80s and going to a country <laughs> where no one knows. I mean, not that no one knows, but you don't know how to speak Spanish or you don't know anything about the culture. So... Uh, somehow they made the move. So my dad actually moved first. And in the 80s, there was a group in Peru, a terrorist group in Peru called Sendero Luminoso, the Shining Path. And so Peru in the 80s was actually not very nice. Uh, literally, my parents would tell me stories about bombs, uh, uh, banks getting bombed, um, you know. And anyways, my, my dad told my mom, I don't know if you really want to come because things are hard here. Uh, and my mom was just like, uh, you know, I'm just gonna come. <laughs> uh, we'll see. We'll build a life. So your dad went. Your dad went first, and then your mom came. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. A year after. Um. And yeah, they did. They did that, and uh, they started working. You know, multiple jobs, ev- everything you can think of, right? Like washing the dishes, uh, anything, literally anything you can think of. And eventually, they saved enough money to open a small restaurant with like three tables. Um, and, uh, they actually learned to cook as they, you know, as they go, as they went. And they, I remember them telling me the first day that we opened the restaurant, we didn't even have enough money to buy rice. Um, <laughs> and so they had to go to the neighbor, borrow rice and then pay them at the end of the day. And that's wow. how, how actually they got started. And obviously you see me now here. And so they've, they've made it in life. Uh, yeah. They own a successful Peruvian Chinese restaurants, which we call Chifa. So my siblings and I were born and raised in Peru. Um, and yeah, we grew up with a dual identity, as you can imagine, like at home, we ate Cantonese food, spoke Chinese. Um, and I speak to my parents in Chinese, but it's like, you know, there's some Spanish words here and there that I have no idea how to say Chinese. 
Um, and at school, I went to a Peruvian Chinese school, uh, which is probably a story for another day. But um, <laughs> yeah, a lot of my friends are, have a similar background as me. And yeah, um, I think because we had restaurants, um, we I had to work a lot when I was a kid. Um, and so when people meet when people met me back then when i when i first moved uh i was already like a lot like super mature in the sense that uh, people thought i was older because of the way i talked even now uh when people talk to me they don't expect me to be the age i am um and so anyways um i ended up moving to the us when i was 16 uh, about to turn 17 so i usually just tell people 17 um and I went to college at USC, which I think I, I saw that you also went to USC. Yeah. And as you can imagine, life was also just so like it was just crazy to go to I, USC. I, I, I grew up like right. I mean, right outside of Los Angeles, and USC was a different world for me. So I can't imagine. Yeah, uh, I think w like one of the craziest things to me was just like uh, you know meeting obviously people from all over the world, but like. I, that's when I learned what the wealth was. Uh, like I remember Same. meeting like someone who whose father like whose father was like the owner of all the McDonald's in Indonesia. <sighs> you know, uh, like driving a Lambo at eighteen. You know, <laughs> no way I could have imagined that someone at eighteen could drive a Lambo. You know, and so, anyways, that was crazy. But I think also a really good experience in the sense that I learned a lot and grew a lot. And when I first moved, my English wasn't as good as it is now. And so as a way to practice, I started writing about things I found interesting. And actually, that's when I learned that I was talented um, in, in marketing specifically and in writing. And I, yeah, I was writing about things I found interesting. And specifically, it was around technology, social impact, uh, especially not grow Like, I know this sounds silly, but like, even learning that people could work at Facebook was crazy to me. Like in yeah. Peru, you were using Facebook, you know, MySpace, High Five was another social platform. And like learning that you could like intern there was like mind blowing to me. And anyways, I was writing about all these things and um, I was doing a lot of research and I found this investor who I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. He's pretty successful, invested in a bunch of companies, traveled to South America, which I was like, okay, there's like some connection there. He happened to be in LA. Um, I showed up 30 minutes early to that uh, talk that he had. Asked him, a, just younger self, Sylvia, had no shame. <laughs> Still have no shame. But <laughs> back then it was like, even like, I have nothing to lose. And I went in, talked to him, literally just wrote down a bunch of notes, published a piece at the end, you know, at the end of that day. And the piece went viral. Hundreds of thousands of people saw it. This was early medium. So there's a lot of like, people um i mean not people just like if a lot of people were seeing it right like in the beginning they would push it to to other folks um yeah hundreds of thousands of people saw it and i kept doing it uh i got the same results and that's when i was like oof like maybe i should do this like as a thing and i started uh working at like an actual company and i started working for a company called startup grind who they they basically are a global community of entrepreneurs um i helped them build their publication from zero to two hundred fifty thousand readers in three months um and wow. that was crazy like you know there was a lot of like learning and trying but um a lot of it was you know learning about how the platform worked um and and connecting with a lot of the founders that were really good writers uh, and also connecting with the audiences to make sure that they distributed a lot of that content and uh i'll go back to this point but actually that work which was right after college led me to get the visa the visa in the green card that i have now um and yeah i mean did, after did you, did you study what did you end up studying at usc did you like was it communications marketing business um so business slash marketing um okay you know, you know how they don't really have like a marketing degree yeah. um yeah so i did business marketing with the minor in design so um which is uh, kind of cool because now i do both and right. uh, yeah uh, i was at that time i was super interested in ux design i started the ux club at usc um and so anyways I, I, it's kind of fun because now i combine both and do it as my full-time job and so yeah um post startup grind i worked at a bunch of tech companies and eventually the last job before starting slam was uh i joined a non national nonprofit uh called xu institute which was part of this bigger organization called the emerson collective 
uh, which is a social impact organization started by Lorraine Powell Jobs. And specifically, XU Institute's mission is to um, rethink the American high school experience. So I was the first digital marketer hired. Um, and the cool thing about this organization was like the vision was so incredible, right? Changing public high schools. That just sounds crazy, right? Like no yeah. matter how much money you can, I don't want to, I don't want to use the word dump, but pretty much dump at the problem, you won't solve it just with money. Um, and so the whole idea was to use media, culture, marketing to transform what day-to-day -day people thought about schools, school boards, right? Uh, like right now it's a hot topic. And so an example of the work we did was like, we did a school board campaign where we built tools internally to let people know who their school board school board members were, you know, and like, um, yeah, text this number and you'll know when your school next, next school board meeting is go, you know, don't let the 50 year old that has been a school board member for 25 years to be reelected. Right. And say it, have younger people that like just went through high school to, to show up, ask questions, be an actual really good uh, board member. Um, and another example is just like, we did a whole TV show, um, where, uh, we partnered with LeBron James. Uh, this was in 2020. Maybe you 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 had a chance to see it, but it was called Graduate Together. I led their marketing, uh, and it was to celebrate the high school class of 2020 because of the pandemic, right? And so that was a whole cultural moment where, like, we're like, you know, kids. I mean, no kids, students and teachers are amazing. Uh, we should celebrate them, right? Like, we shouldn't leave them behind. And so. Yeah, it was using a lot of that, combining all these. It was marketing at a whole new level for sure. Um, and now we get to the slam part, which is like during the pandemic, I had like an epiphany on a trip to Utah uh, where I did a road trip uh, for three weeks where it's just like, I am young for the first time in my life. I had, you know, I had no big responsibilities where I was just like, I need to chase towards something um, because I had sorted out my visa situation. You know, I had paid off everything I needed to pay off. Uh, my parents were not like behind me saying, you need to do this and that. Um, so it was the first time where I was just like, I want to do something I like, it's like where it's like my pure choice, right? And, uh, you know, though the pandemic, of course, was really tough on a lot of folks. Uh, for me, it was the chance to like invest in myself. And January 2021, put my notice and I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. Uh, I knew I knew that I wanted to start a company, but I wasn't sure what specifically. Um, and I did what usually people tell you to do, which is quit your job and then talk to a lot of people, which is what yeah. I did. I reached out to every single person that I had ever worked with. Um, and I told them, this is kind of where I am. Um, I have some ideas and a good amount of them, probably 50% of them were like, I've always wanted to work with you. Would you consider working at my company? And I was like, no, <laughs> I don't want to do that. But like, and that's when the idea came where I was like, I could like uh, put a little bit of my time and like, you know, um, event, you know, eventually bring a team in. And so, yeah, I signed my first client within the first few calls, which was crazy. And like, this was like, probably, okay, my last day at work was, February 5th of 2021, I signed my first client like last month, like last week of February. And then I didn't even have incorporated anything. So I incorporated <laughs> March 1st. I was like, okay, I gotta set up this LLC, you know, figure out my everything, right? All the logistics that, that have to do with starting a company. And yeah, be, I, I feel lucky because a lot of them uh, believe in me and just decided to uh, in, invest in my career pretty much um, and trust me with a lot of their work. Um, but just SLAM specifically is uh, a combination of my skills and now, of course, the skills of, of my team and my passions. And it's a digital marketing agency that focuses on three verticals, uh, no code, um, content marketing and SEO. And uh, for those who don't know, no code is, is literally software where you don't have to the code that much uh there are some coding in between but you don't have to code that much um and so a lot of the work that we do combines seo with web development um and also just coming up with cool marketing campaigns and the types of clients that we have are like mission driven and not in the typical way of like you know this is 
social impactful, but in a way that it's impacting how people live life or work. Uh, but also, you know, like on the social impact side, uh, we work with a lot of nonprofits. So nonprofits, tech companies, startups, um, and some companies are just trying to do something different. Um, but yeah, it, it's been a year and four months. Um, you know, I was, I was telling you privately when we first met, like, it's about to cross a pretty good milestone uh, within the next two months, um, just this year. And yeah, I feel I feel like it's surreal. Um, it's definitely fun. I deeply enjoy it. And I, I do, even though, you know, it's busy with anything that you start, it is like, I love having control of a lot of things versus not having yeah. control. <laughs> Well, I mean, one congratulations on all your success. I mean, I I didn't know that you had started so recently in 2021. That's that's incredible. Yeah. So, um, congrats on that. And so, a, a little bit kind of about our audience, right? We have um, mainly multicultural marketers um, from large organizations, but also those that know that it's important and just kind of want to listen in on that. I think. Um, I think diversity and inclusion, multicultural marketing, and mission-driven are kind of live in the same space. Can you talk a little bit about how you're defining mission-driven or what that means? I think it's pretty interesting because you differentiated mission-driven from social impact. Um, so, like, yeah, yeah, can you just talk a little bit about that? Because I, I think that's interesting. Yeah, I think the main thing is that with, uh, one, the pandemic and just how people work and live, uh, so many things cannot be an afterthought anymore, right? Um, including like even as, something as simple as like company values, right? Yeah. Uh, or, um, you know, investing in a tool that it can save you so much time that you can spend time with your family, right? Um, to me, it, like it, that changes just uh, how you live. And if you, if someone's creating something where you can live a better life, it, it, obviously that's also uh, something that can be interpreted in so many ways. But what I mean is just like, you know, the, the remote work, right? That's something I suppose remote work has allowed me to be able to exercise a lot more, right? That's changing my life. And I, I do think that it's impactful socially for a lot of folks um and that to me is mission driven right like it is is something that um it, where people are actually putting a lot more thought into it where like if something as simple as like even creating an ad right like now people are not like let's just create an ad, ad and just make it catchy and just have people click on it they you know they think about how it's going to impact certain audiences they think mm. about long term you know like this could uh, literally, you know, transform in 10 years how uh, people that have corporate jobs, let's just say, right, like are quitting right now at like a crazy rate and starting companies, right? Like imagine being a t building a tool for people that have had a corporate job for 10 years and now they can actually be creative and start a small business, right? Uh, to me, that's impactful, right? It's not like, oh my God, it, it, you know, when people think impactful, sometimes they think nonprofit, right? That, that's kind of where the mind goes. And that's obviously super impactful. Um, but also I'm thinking about may maybe more broadly, like if it can change a, gr um, a good amount of people uh, like you and I, right, that like came from really non-traditional backgrounds, uh, that to me is impactful. No, I, that, yeah, that makes such total sense. And I think, yeah, you're right. I mean, I think we've, I think we've thought a lot more deeply about our quality of life since the pandemic and realize the traditional way of work and work-life balance is just completely changed, right? I mean, I, yeah, I mean, and, and I'm from someone that, um, like you mentioned, I come from a non-traditional background, but I've worked, I've worked my way up traditionally in a corporate ladder and started a company, and um, it's it's really impacted the the pandemic has really impacted the way I live my life or even think about my life, you know. Yeah, I mean, like you can now go ride your bike, you know, yeah. like in an uh, in a different time that you usually would pre pandemic, right? Um, and that is well, just, just like starting to ride my bike. Like I, so so I used to, like I was really into mountain biking in my late teens, early twenties, and then mm -hmm. college work. I took like almost two decades off, right? And then oh wow, and I and I was always in my head like, oh, I'm gonna start 
writing once this happens, when that happens. But when the pandemic hit, I was like, what am I doing? I need to do this now because I've always wanted to do it. Why am I putting it off? So that's yeah. exactly to your point, right? <laughs> like that it's, yeah. it's improved my life. And like, I mean, think about the ideas that you've came up with while riding your bike, <laughs> you right. know, um, like sure. that's, that's something I've experienced a lot. So yeah, that's kind of how I see it where I'm, I'm, what I'm seeing is actually a lot of large brands and companies, uh, spending more time thinking like deeply around how it's actually going to affect long-term how people live. And obviously there are companies that do it maybe not in the best way, uh, but there are companies that do care and, um, are spending time, uh, figuring out, you know, what could mean for, for folks. Right. Um, and so, yeah, like uh, one, one thing I was going to say is that we have, uh, an internal value in our company to be creative and work with people that are creative. Um, and that definitely means, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of tools around that, like, uh, for, for folks that are quitting their day jobs and spending time doing creative work. Um, and if we can give them the tools and resources to do it pretty easily and remove the frictions of starting a company, for example, right? Like that's impactful to me. Yeah. And, and, and you mentioned too, something about, you know, marketing, right? I think that that goes, um, companies thinking more deeply about what they put in their marketing and not necessarily just for clicks. Right. And that's, that's yeah. really in our wheelhouse. Um, this is a question I just awesome. thought of right now where I'm like, I, I'm thinking about, you know, from your experience, right. As a company, we are always talking about how, um, Latinx in the U S are, are not homogenous. It's very different backgrounds. I think there's been an emphasis, thankfully on, you know, different countries of origins. It's not all Mexico, El Salvador, mm -hmm. Peru, sure. right? And there's also different uh, backgrounds, Afro-Latino. I think what we don't talk about, and, I, and it was really interesting to learn about, um, you know, Latinx with Asian background like yourself. And and how many, I mean, I think you had mentioned there's a million, you know, uh, like 5 million actually in Peru. Five, oh yeah, 5 million in Peru, right? Yeah. So like, I'm curious from you, you know, when you came into the U.S., like, how does, like, does Latinx marketing resonate with you? Like, what, what is that for you personally? Like, when you, when you see a brand is is appealing to your Latinx background, like, I don't know, from a personal level, how does that, does it resonate it never, with you? It never hits the nail because they never talk about Asian. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, except except for maybe LTX, actually. I mean, not yeah. not promoting the conference, but uh, I've known Lily for a while, so she, you know, she she knows me and she knows a lot of folks with with uh, a Asian Latinx background. Um, but I would say it's as far, excuse me, as far as targeting uh, and marketing specifically. Uh, I mean, they're the the general like targeting the language usually works, but when it comes to uh, the, you know, being inclusive about what it means, like, you know, the different backgrounds, um, it, you know, it just doesn't happen. Like, I feel like yeah. from all the audiences, uh, that you can think of under Latinx, that's probably the least thought through and probably because we are the smallest. Um, and also when, you know, sometimes people don't even re like, I, I've been to restaurants where they, you know, talk, talk in Spanish and they, they don't assume that I would ever speak Spanish, which they shouldn't, but, um, you know, it's led to interesting conversations, good and bad. <laughs> and, and, you know, like I, I see it from that point of view, right? Like if a, a, a per, like a random person in the street doesn't know I can speak Spanish or I am Peruvian, it's unlikely that a lot of marketers, especially if you're born and raised in the U.S., would know that because you don't, you've never lived in Peru or Mexico where there's also, uh, you know, an Asian community there and you would never know. And so a lot of it is through the research, right? Learning a lot of uh, the words, the culture, um, and, and how all that happened. Because even, <clears throat> excuse me, within every country, uh, Asians are seen in a very different way. Like in Peru, most Asians are probably middle class, upper, upper middle class. Uh, but if you go to Argentina, it, I, you know, like the, it's different. They get treated really differently and yeah. mainly because of the way they look. Um, and so... You know, even learning those details uh, are really important, right? Especially if you're if you're trying to enter a new market. Um, but yeah, I would say the targeting within the U.S. it's not been great. Definitely needs a lot of work. Um, but uh, you know, it's it's part of the process. It, it's getting better. 
in in Peru, is there is there marketing specifically for the Asian community in Peru, or or not really? Sometimes I would say the there are certain like if I mean you know like within food, uh, like food is a big thing in Peru, and, yeah. and a lot of the top restaurants in the world actually there's one called Maido. It's the uh, it's ranked number tenth in the world. It's Peruvian Japanese fusion, um, and a lot of the acts that you see out there, you do see an Asian man on TV, yeah. you know. Um, like top, the top Peruvian chefs actually have some sort of Asian descendant, not even Chinese, just Japanese or Chinese. And I feel like nowadays, if you walk in the streets of Peru, every three, four blocks, you see a Peruvian, uh, sorry, a Chinese Peruvian restaurant or a Japanese Peruvian restaurant. It's kind of wild. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it feels like it's just part of day to day life. Um, and, and it's, it's just more integrated versus like, let me put you in different groups. It does happen right. in certain locations, but it's definitely more integrated. Yeah, that that that's interesting. Um, yeah, so back to Slam Media. Um, so tell yeah. us, you know, you. I love that you built a company. I was like, I'm focused on founders. I feel like, interestingly, many times agencies just kind of don't necessarily think about that, even though that's like a, such a large market. Like, why why did what what was behind you focusing on on founders like what how tell us about how how you came to kind of think about that audience Oof. and specifically yeah um i i feel like you might relate to this but before starting this company i worked with a lot of agencies huge ones small ones all kinds of sizes and i mean you know i just i didn't love working with them i'm not gonna lie like i didn't <laughs> I had I had some good experiences, of course, uh, but there were some where it's just like I just can't relate, and it was mainly because they didn't have that mentality of like, um, you know, like their vision was just different. Um, and uh, when I came to start Slam, I was like, I want it to be founder led because I want the vision of the marketing campaigns or anything we do to be rooted in something that was the original thought of the founder versus like let me just dump a bunch of ads and see how you know how it lands um and so yeah when i started it i was like i want to be able to understand what the original vision was of, of course it's changed over time um but i think uh, going back to like building stuff that is creative and not boring uh, i want to be able to build stuff that is actually meaningful uh, drives impact uh, on the money side and also so, like you know socially um and i think there's no better way to do that than working directly with the founder versus a group of 10 strategists marketers you know that are just <laughs> sitting in a conference room it you know it's a it's a thing right um yeah. and so i i enjoy it you know that might change in the future as things change but for now um i do love working directly with them and and it sometimes even doesn't have to be even uh just on founders themselves but like if someone has an entrepreneur mindset within a team like we yeah. we love that um yeah um and so then like I, I think you have a great background of you've worked with these large agencies and organizations and then you've worked with um you know founder led teams like a lot of our audience is larger brands people working within larger brands and strategists like how can these large brands and companies incorporate some of what you're doing at slam media that's a good question um i would say like that creative work uh, often come like uh, you you get creative when there aren't that many restrictions uh or like I need to build 10 decks to present this, or I need to sign all these, you know, I mean, I know it's part of the process. It makes sense. Uh, yeah. But I do think that if you spend too much time overthinking about process, um, especially if you're literally trying to come up with something amazing, and I'm not, by the way, I'm not saying that you cannot come up with, with great ideas when I, you know, when you go through processes, but uh, it does block a lot of thoughts because it restricts you to thinking in a box versus like, what's the most bizarre idea I can think of? Um, yeah. And so I would say if there was a space where folks could just think super like weirdly and come up with things that are like, you know, might uh, be outside of the contract, right? Like you could say, 
Um, I feel like that's a good way to start because uh, I feel like that's a that's a problem with a lot of junior people that join creative agencies because you are thought to think in a certain way, like sitting in a room, your your client gives you you know the scope, and then you just have to think within that box. Um, but I wish there was that space where people could just, even if they are silly, right, like write it down because then the best ideas just bounce of each other. Um, yeah, I would say that, you know, I know obviously creative, big creative agencies also are super successful because of process and like um, a lot of other things. But I, I do think that that creative part is missing where, um, you know, I wish it was better uh, for, for, for a lot of them. Yeah, that's so true. I think we, um, and, and you make a good point for people entering agencies. I feel like they do have that creative energy kind of naturally. They're not necessarily bogged down by the processes or the way a certain agency thinks. So like keeping that alive. Right. I mean, and, I, and we, we suffer it from it here at think now, like, um, kind of doing the same thing sometimes till like we wake up and are like, okay, this isn't working. You know, we, we got to come up with something new and um, yeah, I'm inspired. What have you done? So, so for us, I mean, I, I think we've done kind of internal hackathons where hmm. we've um, nope. hackathons are typically just developers, which we have a great development team and we do that, but we have hackathons that are not necessarily developers. Right. So from a research perspective, we talk about, all right, we're having a really hard time re reaching this certain group. Let's let's just take an inventory of what's what's out there, like, and how do we reach people? Can we? And we and like you said, we throw up just interesting ideas, like, can we use WhatsApp for focus groups? Can we mm. use you know, non traditional methods? Um, so yeah, so we 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 do try to incorporate it. Um, I feel like sometimes it's we wait till it's too late where we're having a real issue that yeah. we need to overcome. Like we need to give ourselves, we need to do it preemptively, but, but we try. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Uh, yeah. Hackathons are a great idea. Um, uh, a last thing I was going to say is, and, and I know it's hard for some companies, but one thing we optimize within slam is like do things that bring you joy. Uh, because if you, if, if, if they do bring you joy and you, you are supposed to be really good at it, then the best ideas also come from that. Um, and so it's for my own, like my own calendar, uh, like what I do with my assistant is like, okay, I hate, you know, I hate doing this, this, and this, and I want to spend more time doing this. And so she like kind of learns how to do some of the things that are maybe more operational that you still have to do as a founder. Um, and then that way I can focus my time on doing more creative things. And that has been pretty nice. And I try to do that with my team. Uh, but that definitely helps because when, you know, when you, when, if 70% of your time is focused on doing things that you don't like, but you have to do, like, imagine, you know, you don't have that space to, to be creative either. That, that's that been a game changer for me as a, as a manager. And I think I, as an entrepreneur, that's, that's been the most difficult part is realizing how much of my job was managing. Yeah, um, for sure. Because it wasn't a strong suit of mine, but mm. what was a game changer was your point, like, with people that, you know, report directly to me, I realized that my job was to find out what they enjoy doing yeah, and give them more of that. And like, that's just been a game changer. And it's made me think of managing differently because I'm not telling people what to do. I'm, I'm literally giving them opportunities to do what they like to do. Um, and it's just, it just made it more fun for me and for them. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, that's definitely like just putting work around joy. It's just game changing. Yeah. Yeah. Like we have someone on our team that just likes building new things. And once I get, once it starts getting into the process level, they zone out. And so it's no. been like, <laughs> it's, it's been perfect. Like ideating, building new things, handing it off, you know? So, um, and I'm actually the same way. I like building new things. So I, I try to keep myself. I, I, I made myself part of the product team now where that's, mm. that's what we do now. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, yeah. one thing, one thing that uh, just came to my brain that, uh, talking about big agencies and just marketers and audiences, um, let's talk about the, the Bad Bunny concert that was streamed on, uh, Telemundo. That's like, 
crazy in the I mean it in the best way possible because imagine a, a channel like Telemundo streaming, you know, Bad Bunny, <laughs> which there's a lot of words out there, you know, a lot of words that they muted, but it was pretty bold. So whoever recommended yeah. them to do it, they're attracting a new audience that they were super unlikely to do. And it has come, you know, and then that company obviously is very process oriented. Um, the fact that they were willing to do that and like think about I mean, literally, you had probably a lot, uh, the whole island of Puerto Rico looking at that stream, you know, and like people watching it on YouTube, et cetera. Um, I love that. Like, I know it was bold and scary to do it, but like, it was fun. People enjoyed it. Uh, and it felt like it, it gave it such a fresh look, especially for new audiences to, to look at Telemundo, not as a telenovela. <laughs> you know channel but instead like you can you can talk about pop culture in a pretty meaningful way that's such a good point and i, and I also think about their competitor right like yeah what what a missed opportunity their competitor is larger when you just talk about households and they like they drop yeah. the ball yeah right 100%. like <laughs> like 100%. they would have they have way more distribution and and um yeah, no, you're right. That is a great. That's a great point in terms of a, a, a large company that took a chance um, and widening their audience, right? Because Telemundo hasn't necessarily oh. been ex inclusive, too, right? Yeah. Like it's it's very Mexican focused, but yeah. they realize like this is an opportunity to expand. Like, yeah, that's that's a great point. Yeah, a lot broader uh, and. Yeah, although their their journalists need to be trained and you know speaking speaking maybe youth you know younger like Gen Z millennial language, but other yeah. than that, I thought it was it was amazing <laughs> that they did it. I didn't get to watch it. Did you get to stream it? I watched parts of it. Um, yeah. The you know the highlights beyond you know like him bringing all kinds of uh, reggaeton singers from the past and and, yeah. and like uh, you know folks now like he brought a a trans artist to Telemundo. <laughs> you know what okay. I'm saying? Yeah. That's crazy. He talked about politicians. He talked about the uh, companies that uh, basically have a monopoly on the electrical system in Puerto, Rico, in Puerto Rico. And, you know, that's bold for Telemundo to stream that. Um, and, I mean, obviously, Bad Bunny has such a big audience that he doesn't care what he's saying. Uh, but, you know, you can imagine if so, millions of people are watching that stream, and the impact that it could have. You know, and, and I think about Bad Bunny as an artist, I think for me, I mean, we have him in our decks. Um, like he just, like you think about when he came out, I believe he just came out in 2019. Yeah, or, or, 16. Um, and he was well, 16. He was new, you know, but he was doing yeah. like, he was still having his job at a supermarket and like making music. Yeah, I mean, okay, so 2016, like, and he's the number one yeah. artist. It's just, I don't know if we've seen anyone rise that quickly, and and I, and I attribute a lot about it to his philosophy as an artist of of inclusion, like for sure. You know, like you mentioned trans, right? He's been a, a supporter of LGBTQIA community since day one, and one hundred percent. You know, and and in in a genre that's typically machismo right and also yeah. you know unfortunately some artists that are that are racist um and 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 he's been completely the opposite and and i think he's just such a great example of someone um and and at this point he's a brand right like a brand sure. where inclusion and diversity are front and center at the core and and it's and it's a huge not only is it like not only does it make sense in the society we live in now, but it's also extremely lucrative, as we've seen. Oh, yeah. right? Like, it, you just have a bigger audience, and I just think that's so great. Yeah, and like, not to compare names, uh, and I probably won't, I don't want to mention it, uh, but like, there are artists that fit the similar profile as him that are pretty big, have incredible talent managers that are incredibly famous and have gotten a lot of backlash for the things that they have said because they're not inclusive. Right. Um, and you literally could put them side by side and you can see why the other one has gotten a lot more up and the other person right. has stayed like the same. Yeah, and to your point, ta Telemundo tapped into that, right? They, they got instant credibility 
Um, yeah, I mean, the, I don't do. know if you, I took a screenshot because I was like, I, I need to just save this for the future. But when the Beyonce uh, album dropped that same day where the stream yeah. happened, I was like, Delemundo trending number three <laughs> under Beyonce's album. That's crazy. <laughs> that is crazy. Wow. Um, yeah, no, that was awesome. So um, believe it or not, we're almost at our time. But before oh, we wow. end, I want to know. What's what's next for for Slam Media Lab? Like, what's what's in the pipeline? Um, yeah, yeah. Tell us so, more. Yeah, we've been we've been definitely able to achieve a ton during our first year. First by myself, and now uh, with five people full time and a bunch of contractors that you know if we we're maybe bringing on board. Um, and our work has definitely skyrocketed. Uh, the, a few things. We are actually b starting to build products internally uh, for companies that are trying to impact work life um, and also, you know, like socially. And um, I think the focus specifically is actually organizations that we are currently working with that are not very techy, but they do want tools that are like to help automate a lot of the stuff that they do. And so we are trying to see if this is an avenue that we want to um, invest in. Um, we're starting a, like a slam series. People in, in, in organizations are slamming it. <laughs> I know, <laughs> it's very meta. Uh, oh, but we're just trying a bunch of things. Uh, I think uh, my my whole thing is that I don't I don't know if I want Slam to be a services uh, agency for you know the next few years, but I, which is why I think it's important to use the time now that we have the time to explore uh, a lot of the stuff that we could build to help people, and I'm really thrilled about that. Um, and yeah, uh, it's growing. Um, we have amazing clients and. Uh, you know, we were looking forward to like creating things that are just different, that are not boring, um, and that challenge the status quo in some way. Um, but other than that, I think I I want my team to be happy. So doing work that brings us all joy, uh, including myself, and giving us that flexibility that we all love to to do also things outside of work that are fun and joyful and spending time with family and friends. For sure. Awesome. I'm excited, excited to see what products you launch and um, congratulations again on, on, you. on your success. And um, thanks for joining and thank you everybody for listening. If people want to connect with you, Slam Media, what's, can you share some of your yeah. socials, best um, way to follow you? Yeah, Twitter, it's Lee Sam Sylvia, L-I-S-I-M-S-I-L-V-I-A, -S -S Sylvia with an I. Um, and then, uh, you know, I'm also pretty quick with email. It's just my name at slammedialab.com. Um, so um, thank you, Mario. This is super fun. Um, really appreciate you inviting me. And uh, hopefully we'll see each other soon. Yeah, definitely. Thank you uh, for joining. This was this was awesome. Great to learn about your journey. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Thanks to everyone listening in. To get more multicultural insights, check us out at thinknow.com and follow us on social media. You can also subscribe to this podcast on your favorite platform. Final thank you to our producer, Lucas Martinez, who created our intro music and makes our podcast sound great. T-mail him reach out to martinez.lucas.a at gmail.com.